last, if you want to go and turn to Acts chapter number one, uh, last week, we were doing a, a couple of week studies on the prayer life of the church, which is the power of the church. We have, and when I say we, I'm talking about Christianity as a, as a whole in the world. In a lot of places, we've, we've substituted a lot of things for what God said we're supposed to be doing. Uh, but the prayer is the power of the church. The prayer, the Holy Spirit, and the Word are the three things that are, are spiritual weapons in this life. And not only as a church, but individually. Now last week we looked at the prayer life of the Apostle Paul for the churches. Uh, besides that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. That was my text. Uh, this week we're actually going to look at the prayer life of the church. Last week the prayer life for the church. This week the prayer life of the church. Now, I, I need to make an explanation before we go through... I don't want you to think we're going to be here for five hours, but if I get as far as I want to go, we're going to go from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 13. And that shouldn't scare anybody because, you know, I know everybody needs to go home and go to bed at some time. I'm simply going to look at the prayer life of the church in several places, so it doesn't sound as bad for as long as it's going to be. But uh, we need to explain something to you. The book of Acts is the history of the early church first be Jerusalem, after that Antioch, and by 100 AD there were preaching stations all over the Roman Empire. Uh, and by the way, largely through the instrumentality of the Apostle Paul. Uh, there, were, there was usually one church in each town especially the major cities. Uh, they owned no property. They were very poor. Most of the early church was initially made up of Jewish people. And when they turned to Christ, their families booted them out and they lost their job and they lost their homes. And so the care of them fell on the church. And then after that, the early church was predominantly made up of slaves. And I explained Dulos in the Sunday morning sermon uh, and while most of them had decent masters and it was more like having a job, but they were still paid next to nothing. So uh, churches met in homes, churches met in fields, in barns, and wherever they could meet. So that's kind of the beginning of the early church. And they had nothing. They were extremely poor. Uh, a few churches had one or two wealthy people in it. Lydia, the church in Philippi. Uh, a couple of families in the Corinthian church. But uh, the churches were extremely poor. They didn't have anything. They couldn't do anything that we do. First of all, they only used what funds they did have for two things. Number one, take care of the preachers. And number two, take care of the poor in the church. That includes the widows in the church. That's, that's all that, that was ever done. There is a statistic by the Southern Baptist Convention, and they're big on statistics, that's all right, uh, that says the average church in our country uses, it averages, take the churches that give a lot to the churches that give nothing, but when you average all, the, they've got 35, 36,000 churches, when you average what they all give beyond their local budget to missions, the average Southern Baptist Church in America uh, gives, uh, keeps 94% of the income at home for their buildings and programs and supplies and da 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 uh, The early church kept nothing at home. It, I mean, it, it was done. It's all taken used to take care of people. So, and that's not a statement against owning property. It's been a real blessing. 
churches are beginning to find out, very frankly, uh, you know, most, most of the churches were built, the buildings were built when those churches were at a high. And uh, now that our churches are seriously dwindling, you got a few trying to take care of what you used to have a ton of people to take care of. And you know, we're, we're an illustration of that. And that's not a negative statement, it's just a statement of reality. I get a lot of magazines, uh, Christian literature, and uh, what's keeping churches to be, of oh, many, many, many churches together today is, is a faithful few. What it is. It is what it is, and we keep doing what we're supposed to be doing. So, tonight, the actual prayer lives of the churches. So, we'll begin. Uh, well, I never said what I was going to say. I got to go rambling and, and, and say what I was going to say. My only point out of what I'm going to show you tonight is that the churches were built on prayer. That's the point I'm trying to make. Because you're going to have speaking in tongues, you're going to have a, a miracle, you're going to have apostolic authority, uh, you're going to have the doctrinal issues like uh, uh, do Gentiles have to keep the law? There are all kinds of issues. Uh, there's a church split in here. There's uh, there's uh, who wants to be a mission? There's all kinds of problems. That, none of that's my subject here. My subject is, how did they handle everything? Uh, I, by the way, I made some, uh, in, in what I'm going to look at tonight, I just jotted down a few th causes that cause these churches to be so much in prayer. Number one, Christ's command. That's always number one, period. And number two, loneliness. They were the only church in town and usually persecuted. Fear, because they were, they were persecuted need of power, because they didn't have anything to rely on. If the Lord didn't help, they'd be wiped off the face of the earth. Inability, inability, uh, slaves, uh, persecution, financial needs. Uh, one of the ministers, the Apostle Paul, and even the other apostles, was fundraising to take care of the needs. Uh, of uh, the church. And of course, church division in two churches, uh, need of leaders. In the early church, there were no leaders. And then, of course, uh, at, by the time we get to the church at Antioch, missions. So, my point tonight is simply to show you the prayer life, not for, but of the church. Uh, Acts chapter number one. Uh, Verse number four, and being assembled together with them, the Lord and the apostles commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Uh, and like I said, I'm not interested in the doctrinal issue here, now I'm just interested in the point of prayer. First of all, the word wait it doesn't mean like you're sitting in a waiting room for your turn to go and see the doctor. The, the Bible word wait means, it doesn't say it, but it means wait on the Lord. In other words, pray. Be still before the Lord. And um, then, I, then I need you to go in the same chapter, verse number 14. Uh, and when they, that is the group that the Lord said, be still and wait, when they were come in, they had an upper room. Everybody thinks it was probably the upper room of the Lord at the Lord's Supper. And it's very likely that it was. But when they went in, they went up into an upper room. Same one. Where both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, uh, Matthew, James, Alphaeus, Simon, Logos, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So, the very beginning of the, by the way, about 120 is what they had here. About 120. Uh, it began and was sustained by prayer. When the Lord said, wait, and by the way, what they were supposed to wait for was the, 
Pentecost, which is a whole different another sermon, but basically what they're supposed to wait for uh, can be summed up, when you study Acts chapter 2, can be summed up in one word, power, spiritual power. The number one need of any church and the number one need of any Christian is spiritual power. Or we have, we have a word for it that we like to use. Grace. Grace. Without God's grace and help. What did Jesus say? Without me, you can do nothing. We're living in the age of the lot, you say, in church, Revelation chapter 3, 18 to the end of the chapter, where they said, man, we're rich, we don't need anything. And you know what Jesus said to them? He said, you're wrong, you need spiritual power, life, spiritual life. Only God can give life. So, uh, so they, they prayed, and the rest of the chapter talks about that. And then as a result of this prayer meeting of 120 people in this church, chapter 2, verse number 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And it's an interesting thing how many times as you study the life of the churches in the book of Acts, it says something like, I just read here, they were all with one accord in one place. They met and they were in one accord. Now, Pentecost, or the coming of the blessing of the Holy Spirit, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. That wind was not promised, that just came, which is one of the words for the Holy Spirit. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, again, emblematic of the Holy Spirit. And it sighed upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, they were already saved. They were already indwelt by the Holy Spirit. This coming of the Holy Spirit was the blessing of God, the power of God, the Spirit of God. For them to live and serve the Christian faith. There was no hocus pocus, whatever is being said today. It just didn't there. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit that gave them utterance. Now what did happen there, they were supernaturally, miraculously, at that very point, able to communicate to the multitudes that had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So that was definitely a miracle, which, by the way, is not needed in the American churches today because we all speak English. Plus, it was a one-time event. And furthermore, the word tongues, uh, uh, tongues in the Greek simply meant language. Knowable, understandable, learnable language. Yeah. Later on, there were six, it lists in chapter 2, 16 different nationalities and they all heard them speak in tongues languages now I don't make a doctrine out of this but I have heard more than once in my life missionaries going to places where they couldn't you know they were trying to learn the language and were struggling and hadn't really got there yet uh, and were just in the early stages of that and uh, yet the occasion came where they needed a witness and all of a sudden they were able to speak that language for just long enough to witness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like I said, don't make a doctrine out of that, but nor do I want to go so far to the left and, and just say that could never happen. If there's a need, God can make that happen. God is not bound. But what's going on in our churches here uh, began with the Pentecostal movement, went to the Charismatic movement, then went to the Word of Faith movement, and now it's broken off into all kinds of little groups uh, that uh, speaking in an unknown language in the church. No, that's, that's, that's not Bible. That's misinterpreting. But here's the point. This early church needed to be able to witness to the multitudes, and God enabled them to do it in answer to prayer. That's what I want you to see. Now, let's go to chapter number 3. Deal a lot of Peter's life. Acts chapter number 3, verse number 1. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. The hour of prayer. Now, the early church, originally the Jerusalem church, they met at the temple, but not, not 
in the temple had three sections. The outer court, which was ironically called the court of the Gentiles, and then the middle court, for the Jewish people, and then the inner court where only the high priest went. The Gentile church met out in the open outer court, basically a humongous porch. And uh, the Christians met there at a regular time daily to pray. And of course, under persecution, they needed the comfort, they needed the encouragement. And so we find that... Uh, they were there. Now, verse number 6 and 7. What happened? And of course, you understand, there's this, uh, there was this uh, layman. Is this the layman or the blind man? I think it's the layman. Yeah, oh, asking on. Okay. And uh, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, that happened at a prayer meeting, okay? That's what I want you to see. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. There is this somewhat humorous antidote about a priest teaching a class of seminarians and braggingly when studying this text said, well, they believe that Peter was the first pope, uh, he braggingly said, well, we no longer have to say, a silver and gold have I none. And one of the boys in the class spoke up and said, yeah, and neither can you now say, rise up and walk. Yeah. <laughs> if that weren't so sad and true, that could be funny, but it's not. So, again, there was a need for something to be done. Peter knew he couldn't. There was prayer made. And the need was met. Uh, we studied last week in Matthew 17, 21. This kind can come out by nothing but by fasting and prayer. Now then, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, you got the first persecution. And they were beaten and eventually thrown in jail and finally released. And... and uh, uh, the first thing they did, they hightailed it back to the local church. And what happens? They were informed that they couldn't preach anymore. And they were threatened. Uh, and uh, verse number 31. And when they had prayed, the flesh was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Uh, several things happened. Like I say, they were they were threatened, arrested, beaten, put in jail. They, they were released. They were, they were told they can't preach anymore, and they went back to the church. And there was a prayer meeting. As a result of the prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit came into that place. And not only did they not keep silent, they were able to go out, had to had the power to go out, to go out and preach with boldness. Now remember, these were the folks that when before the crucifixion, they all ran away. So again, there was a need. They prayed. God met the need. Then I want you to go to uh, Acts chapter 6. This is the one that you all know the, know the most. But now the church had over 10,000 people. And... Uh, They were Jews, and there were Greeks in the church. You had two classes of people in the church. Now, I think I brought this out, mm, I think it was, I don't know if it was a Sunday school lesson or a, a Sunday morning sermon a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Jews considered everybody, at, at this particular time, uh, in A.D. about 30, whatever, at this particular time, anybody that wanted a Jew was a Greek. They clumped all nationalities into that Greek. So you had two classes of people in the church. And the Greek ladies, the Greek people were beginning to complain that the Jewish widows were getting better care than the Greek widows. And so you know what the apostles did. They, they uh, asked for some godly men 
we believe this is where deaconships began, and the need was met. But they said, Acts 6-4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Lord. Now, you know, I think we all know, and I, I, I hope not, but probably everyone has been in a certain situation where there's a rift, and the only way to settle the rift was some people just left. I think we, most people experienced it. But because there was prayer made, instead of the church splitting, here's what happens, verse 7, and the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. The great company of the priests were obedient unto the faith. A serious church problem was avoided, and progress was continued to be made because of a praying church. Then let's go to uh, let's see where do I want to go to. Well, I I, I want to go to Acts chapter nine since we're in the book of Acts. But there's a couple more things I, I want you to see about the Apostle Paul. And we know the story. He had gotten letters of authority from the temple leaders to go to Damascus and find the Christians and bring them back bound and put them in prison. The Lord short-circuited him and he was saved on the Damascus road. There, there are, But there's a human side to the story, folks. And the human side of the story is prayer. First of all, I want you to look, look in Acts chapter uh, 9, verse number 9. And he, he's talking about Paul, after he got saved, of course, he's blind, uh, temporarily blind. He was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And I want you to go to... So Ananias sent to him, in verse 11, the Lord said in the horizon, going to the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. And then I want you to draw all the way down to verse number 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. I could challenge, and I do challenge you, you could walk through every chapter in the book of Acts and every need was met by prayer. Now, every need was not met quite the way it was being prayed for, but that's irrelevant to my immediate subject, that every need was prayed for and in one way or another meant by prayer. Uh, I, I want you to look at uh, Acts chapter number 12. Peter, and, and there's a story in Mark about Peter that all of you know uh, when he was in prison. And the church was in the home of the mother of John Mark, who later ended up being a helper. And uh, the church had met together and they were praying uh, for uh, uh, Peter to be released. And he was being held in a cell with four soldiers to, chained to him and two at the door. And the chains fell off. He was an angel came. He was delivered. You know the story. And he showed up at, at, at the house where everybody was praying. There's something else about Peter. In uh, John, in Acts, uh, chapter number 12, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. The church prayed. There was the need, they prayed, the need was met. Now, one more, because it's moving on, time to move on. I, I want you to go to Acts chapter number 13. Now, we've gone from the Jerusalem church to uh, uh, some other activities. Let's go to the Antioch church. First, purely Gentile church. I had some Jews in it, but it was purely 
uh, primarily a Gentile church uh, on Gentile ground. Now there were in the church at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Uh, prophets, by the way, is preachers and teachers. And as they ministered to the Lord, that way, that as they ministered to the Lord was a Pauline expression for they were praying. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. You know, that's another whole different subject that I could, I have a good lesson on that if anybody ever wants me to do it. The Holy Ghost said, now, we have no idea how they knew that. We, we obviously don't believe it was an audible voice since the Holy Ghost is spirit. But he spoke to hearts. Let me tell you something. How to get to people's hearts is to pray for them. And everybody in this room, we got somebody we need to be praying for. Spiritually and physically. The Holy Spirit said, Sit for every day, Barnabas and Saul, and Saul for the work. Once so I have called. This is the beginning of the first missionary movement. God picked the men. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent their way, and they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto, and then it lists where they went. God calls, God sends. God meets the needs of personnel in a church and He does it by the prayer life of the church. There is the divine side of God's appointment. There is the human side of responsibility. And we don't have to explain God to try to justify it. We just have to believe it. Our responsibility. And, and, and folks, uh, that's where I'm going to stop, but you can just work your way through every chapter, chapter after chapter and chapter. In the book of Acts, you're going to find the need. And it was usually a need that only God can fill. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. So, last week, Paul prayed for the churches. This week, the churches prayed. One more thing. Uh, I want to close with Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Well, it was 19 or 20. Now here's the Lord talking to his disciples, which were the foundation of the Jerusalem church. And again I said to you that if two of you, now that really said it, it I know it just sounds like two or more, but it, but it means one, two, or more. Can be two, can be five, can be twenty. And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. Now, you have to qualify that. We're, to, we're not talking about worldly, godless people. We're talking about committed believers, okay? It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And then this, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, thereby in the midst of me. Now, the reason I want to close with that, that's a neutral, what it's called a neutral verse. That's not applied. He's speaking to the disciples, but he's obviously applying to all of us. Uh, this is a principle, a biblical principle, that applies anywhere. One of the greatest revivals, there have been seven really serious revivals in the last 2,000 years. One was the Welsh revival. Uh, between 15 and 20 men met on the lunch hour for a couple of years. Ate their lunch and prayed, and that's how the Welsh revived it again, with just a handful of miners. So, the point is, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. Amen? Amen. So, I hope that encourages us to do what we're supposed to do. Be faithful to the Lord and pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for coming tonight. God bless you all.